Excellent. Well, good morning, everyone, um, and lovely to see so many of you here. Thank you, Condi, for the, the introduction there. Now, just a note quickly on the title of my presentation. So, only the fittest investors survive. Now, just in terms of being clear, disclaimers, etc., when we talk about fitness here, we're certainly not talking about the physical fitness of the investors themselves. This is very much more focused on how you can be sensible in terms of integrating sustainability within your investment process. Now, in terms of the agenda today, I think the two, the two kind of inescapable truths of my own, if I may borrow Gavin's phrase, is for me, sustainability has just got to the point where it is really too important to ignore. There are significant developments in terms of trends globally, which we'll touch on during the presentation, which means that to survive, investors will have to be able to demonstrate that they're integrating ESG within their portfolios. Now, alongside that, I don't think greenwashing or inefficient implementation of ESG flies anymore. There have been managers that have tried to do it in the past, whether when you look at perhaps passive alternatives. If those the, those decisions and those considerations when integrating ESG in an investment process are negatively impacting or detrimental to returns, those are the managers that will struggle on a forward-looking basis. You need to be thinking about integrating ESG in a way that is very much consistent with your existing investment process and on a forward-looking basis additive to returns. Now, as a firm at Schroeder's, sustainability is clearly important based on the the booklets that you're using today and other terms that we've mentioned so far. And what I'm going to try to do this morning is run you through both at a firm level, but more importantly at an investment level, what I mean by integrating ESG in an investment-led way, mainly in a global equity portfolio, but also touching on the local context as well. So looking at the development of the theme, the chart on the left-hand side here is really looking at a number of different ways to really emphasize that point that sustainable investing is no longer niche and it's too important to ignore within your investment thought process. We're looking at various measures here. If you think about sustainable assets under management, if you think about companies in terms of demonstrating their sustainability credentials to potential and existing investors, everything is on, is on the increase. The global sustainable investment market has increased from 2016 to today from $23 trillion to $30 trillion, which gives you an idea of the scale of the assets and the weight of money moving in this direction and, and why that's an additional criteria that you need to be considering within your investment process. Now, we do recognize that a few challenges do still remain, and we outline these on the right-hand side of the page here. And the outcome of, of this is from our global institutional investor survey, where each year we speak to multiple institutions, in this case over 650, across 20 different locations that are in aggregate responsible for over $25 trillion worth of assets, and ask them what their thinking is, is currently on this topic. Now you can see that these challenges do remain, and the top three that were cited almost unanimously across all of the regions were performance returns, so I'd love to inter integrate ESG, all of my underlying investors are asking me about it, but I'm worried that it's going to impact my returns. Secondly, the data quality, or lack of transparency around ESG data. And finally, around both reporting and also measuring and managing the associated risks with these exposures. Now, hopefully, as we go through the presentation, I'll be able to, to reinforce our view, which we strongly believe at Schroeder's, that all of these areas, these challenges, these potential barriers, can be overcome if you take a sensible approach to integrating ESG, both in the portfolio, but also with your active ownership activities, which is a key component of how we think about this at Schroeder's. So moving on to the firm level. So sustainability at Schroeder's is, is definitely nothing new. We've been integrating ESG across all of, all of our investment processes and thought processes for, for some, some period of time. And as Gavin said, the goal this year for 2020 is that ESG is fully integrated across everything that we do um, as a firm. So it's very much a strategic focus and priority for us. But we've been doing it for a really long time. 
Over that period, we built up a considerable central capability in the form of our sustainable investment team. And a number of you, having been to conferences like this before, will have come across Jessica Ground, um, who heads up that team. That team is now a 17-person dedicated team of ESG specialists. And in most cases, they're sector specialists, and they're also responsible for spearheading engagement and also voting activities for the companies that they're responsible for. So with those people in the central team, together with the global Schroders Analyst Network on the ground in the country speaking the local languages, we can really demonstrate that we're having active impact within the companies that we're invested. Clearly that's recognized in terms of initiatives, global industry bodies like our UNPRI um, assessment, which has been consistently at that high level for a number of years. So this is really the backdrop, which stems from the fact that ESG and sustainability is at the core of our beliefs as a firm and helps on the active ownership side. But what I really want to focus on today is what that means in, a, in an investment portfolio context and the impact within particularly a global equity fund. So how do we think about ESG as a desk? And before I go on, I should say QEP, so quantitative equity products. So there is a, a systematic angle to our approach, but it all very much starts with fundamentals first and foremost. And ESG is, is no different in that respect. You can see the central sustainable investment team is, is certainly a key component of how we think about this. But in terms of integrating it within the portfolios themselves, we've developed our own proprietary QEP ESG model, hence Condi's comments earlier about the acronym. So bear with me. The QEP model is something that we developed back in the lead up really to 2015 when we launched our very first dedicated ESG strategy. We very quickly realized um, that this wasn't an area where you can simply buy in an external provider. You very much need to be thoughtful about how you put a rating, a ranking, a model together and make that consistent with your investment process. And over the period, we've, we've significantly developed the model. It is very dynamic in nature and it's now fully integrated across all of the portfolios that we manage on the desk, which includes the, the QEP core fund that Doug mentioned earlier. Now on the right hand side, intentionally detailed, because um, we're going to go through each one of these components in, in more detail as we move through the presentation, but the key point here is that ESG is difficult. There's a lot of different angles that you need to consider and you need to be looking to combine a wide array of underlying inputs, transform the raw data, understand the materiality, the conditionality within each of these areas in order to reach that view of implementing ESG through that investment lens. And finally, to our point, you need to make sure that you're able to, as objectively as possible, measure those ESG outcomes within the portfolio. So looking at impact, looking at relative position versus the index. We've got a number of different reporting lenses that I can talk you through later as well in terms of looking to lead the thought process in the industry on how you can represent your impact as investors within a fund like this. So starting with governance, and there's no, there's no kind of coincidence as to why we do GES rather than ESG. And looking around the room, I'm sure there's no surprises here that governance is incredibly important um, in driving investment returns. The way that we think about governance in our model is very much focused on that fundamental lens. So you'll notice here that we've got terms like accounting red flags, we've got dividend policies, more quality, high governance, kind of traditional um, fundamental measures. But we also team those with more, I suppose, ESG governance measures like board composition, diversity, how much independence do you have on your board. And with all of these components combined, we have a vast number of underlying measures, which we combine, determine the, the relative materiality of these components and combine into our overall governance model. Now you'll notice we also look at country risk as a component here, and I'll, I'll pause there because we'll move on to a, a case study example um, as we go through. On the right hand side, now we are a quant team, however that doesn't mean that we look at back tests and, and point at back tests being predictors of the future, but I think it, it's rare that I've come across anyone who would argue that more well-governed companies are likely to outperform over the longer term. Here we're showing a historical performance of our governance model through time. And the key takeaways here would be that tilting towards good governance companies is beneficial in terms of returns, but actually it's even more important to avoid those companies with poor governance characteristics. And whilst the picture is strong globally, 
it's even more pronounced in emerging markets. And that links to the fact that higher governance in a similar way to higher quality is more scarce and therefore more high, highly prized and therefore re rewarded in a return sense. So governance is very much the key, the, what we would see as the alpha driver. And for that reason, we apply the model universally across all of the stocks within our 15,000 um, stock universe. And we can do that in terms of the, the kind of data concern because we're using a lot of fundamental accounting measures within this where we have full coverage um, across that universe. So moving on to a case study, and obviously South Africa, um, given where we are, was, was the one that we chose. Um, and to talk you through a little bit more detail on the country risk monitor. So this has been in place for many, many years. We launched our first dedicated um, emerging market strategy back in 2012, um, and it's a key component that we use within that fund um, in terms of, think of this more as a, a risk management tool rather than as a return driver in terms of taking views on, on currencies, et cetera. We broadly split the model into five key components. We've got four areas which are more economic, um, kind of growth, more traditional um, kind of indicators. So we look at currency valuation, but also the credibility of that currency. So how willing and able is that government, government to support that currency on a forward-looking basis? We look at measures of credit risk and also growth prospects. But actually the most important variable within the model where we place the most weight is on the political and ESG, ESG angles. So again, you know, nothing new to us. Now, the way that this, this impacts the overall governance model is that we use it more as a conditional term. So if you think about some of the characteristics of companies which you could question whether they're desirable, so areas like a high level of government ownership, as an example, or um, approaches within, within the company in terms of shareholder exposure, so do you have a controlling shareholder? What's helpful to team with that is the backdrop within the market in which that company is based. So what is the environment that that company is operating in and how does that potentially heighten those company level risks? So it's very much as a, as a conditional factor. So all things being equal, if you are a uh, government owned or high degree of family um, ownership within Norway, that's a very different prospect to if that was the case in Russia, where the governance risk is, is, is a lot higher and that would receive a higher penalty um, within our model. Now, we also use it at a portfolio level um, to manage currency-related risks. So where we have positions in countries, and South Africa is, is a good example of this, where we like the stocks from a bottom-up perspective, but we have concerns at the country level, what this enables us to do is comfortably take that bottom-up exposure, but we would look to hedge the active overweight position that we have to the currency. So, so take some of that risk off the table, but it doesn't prevent us from investing in countries where we see attractive opportunities bottom-up. And now you can see on, on the right hand side, we show um, this kind of spider chart. Um, so South Africa there is in the, the bright blue color. Um, so whilst you can see that you know, clearly the weakness in the RAND is reflecting some of the other risks um, that we see in, in the areas, as I mentioned, the important thing here is, is first of all, the awareness of this within your process. And secondly, how you use this as a tool to enable you to still get that bottom up exposure, but with the mindset and the recognition of the political um, and economic environment in which the, com the countries and the companies are operating in um, as well. So we've covered governance. Next up is environmental considerations. And this is slightly different in the way that we think about it and the way that we implement it within the process. The reason for that is that you have to be a lot more focused and industry specific in the way you think about environmental considerations. They just don't apply in the same way for tech companies as they do for mining companies. So the materiality there is really, really key. And the types of areas that we look at, certainly carbon intensity um, is one of the areas that we look at that's on a, a current and also a historical basis to understand how companies have been successful in reducing their carbon intensity through time. But then we also look at areas like stranded asset risk. Um, so understanding which areas of a company's balance sheet, their asset base, may potentially become stranded in a world where these matters become increasingly important. And again, I don't think I really need to make the point that I believe that will be the case moving forwards because we've seen such significant interest over this peak over the last really 12 months to 12 months to, to 18 months, that this is important now. It's not necessarily um, only a forward-looking uh, consideration. Now, how does that impact the portfolios? Well, we have a degree of, of dialing up or dialing down of the impact of this across the funds that we manage. What we're showing at the bottom here is the picture for our dedicated ESG strategy. 
So where we run a fund where that bar is, is just that, that little bit higher, we actually go as far as excluding thermal coal entirely uh, from the portfolio and have a much more risk managed exposure to other areas of fossil fuels. Over the recent years, so back in, in 2018, we actually seeded an ex-fossil fuel strategy with a Swedish investor in the ESG fund. So whilst I'm traveling around globally, there are different varieties of or different levels um, of interest and of engagement on this topic. But in somewhere like the Nordic, Sweden you know, have gone as far already to say absolutely not to fossil fuels. And they couldn't care less in terms of the performance of the energy sector. They've made a philosophical decision that they don't want to be invested um, in that area. Similarly, on the right-hand side, we are intentionally reducing the carbon intensity of the portfolio versus the index as a function of that integration. And that's remained around a 70% reduction versus the index over the five-year period um, that we've been running the strategy. And you know, that's not just looking at the more traditional resource um, areas of the market. We're also looking through the value chain, so other areas like airlines, for example, um, we wouldn't own any of those companies uh, within, within this portfolio. And then finally on to social. Um, so the social considerations, we would view them very much as the most subjective area. Um, a lot of the considerations here are around, you know, do you or don't you have a policy tick box in this particular area, which doesn't really give you the full picture in terms of what the company is doing in practice. So we're very keen to focus on more objective data points. Examples of those would be uh, diversity measures, but also things like fatalities and injury rates for companies where you can actually get the data point itself rather than taking a view on disclosure or, or not disclosing. Because of that subjectivity, we also find engagement to be an incredibly useful tool to actually look beyond what's disclosed by the companies and understand by having a conversation with them where they are in their process of heightening measures or risk management policies around a particular topic. And then we do also look at um, exclusions because a lot, a lot of this is about uh, penalizing bad practices rather than necessarily rewarding the good ones. The chart below um, shows what the impact of excluding certain areas from just using the, the general global equity index and just taking out those industries or sectors um, as appropriate over the last 5, 10 and 15 years. Now often I find myself, well not so much recently, but Historically, I found myself in meetings where um, you know, some of the, the older members of, the, of the, the meeting quote years in history, 60s, 70s, where certain areas of, of, the, of the market outperformed very strongly, like tobacco, and how that would have been detrimental on their returns. Now, if you look at this, the, the scale is very narrow. So the maximum up there is 1.2%. So what we're really trying to show, the, the bars are small for a reason, which is that there is very little impact in terms of excluding these areas from a portfolio, historically. And actually in areas like the, on the more environmental side, you can see that over the recent past, it would have been beneficial to exclude these areas from your portfolios. Now clearly there's a, a dependency on commodity um, cycles within this, but I think it, it's very, very difficult to argue that that these areas are going to become more in favor on a forward-looking basis. And actually, whether it's political, whether it's regulatory, or even social pressures, it's going to be increasingly difficult for investors to justify um, owning these types of areas within their funds. Now, on top of that, when you have a universe as broad as ours, so we look at 15,000 stocks globally, what that means is that it's very, very easy for us to substitute, for example, a tobacco company for another company that has all of the good characteristics associated with tobacco, so at times attractive in terms of valuation, high quality in, in some respects, and, and perhaps an attractive uh, dividend uh, policy, but without that social risk. So we don't see this as detrimental or having any impact in terms of the opportunity set that we have, and actually it's a sensible risk reduction strategy if you think about how things are going to change uh, in the future. So we've talked a little bit about the components that go into the ESG rating, but that's not where the thought process stops. You really need to be careful about how you think about combining those inputs when you put together um, a rating. And as a reference point here, we've used some of the external providers um, to, to show a view of how, how they think about putting these together and why, you know, in our mind, it doesn't necessarily link with my, my earlier point of making, the, making sure this is an investment um, led approach. This is what you'll see a lot of um, 
passive indices using uh, within their process. And the key thing here is that it, it, can lend, it can lead to some quite unintended consequences in terms of the exposures that you end up within the portfolio. So on the left-hand side here, we're showing the bar charts represent the correlation of the underlying pillar, be that E, S, or G, to the overall rating that that company produces. So you can see on the, on the left-hand side where we have the two providers, the purple bar, which represents the social considerations, has by far the highest level of correlation with the overall score. Now, if we think back to the previous slide where I was mentioning how subjective a lot of the social areas are, and previous slides to that where we, we kind of, I hope, all agree that governance is, is really key in this area, it's quite unusual to then see social having the highest correlation to the overall rating. If you compare that to our view, we intentionally place that additional emphasis on governance um, within the process, and that's why that 0.85 is the, the highest level um, of correlation to the overall rating. So governance is intentionally the kind of anchor variable within the model. Now, the other point to recognize is on the right-hand side. So another thing that a lot of providers do is that they look to industry normalize the results. And what this creates is, from a kind of a marketing or optical perspective, is that within each industry, you're getting kind of a best-in-class view. And whilst that may, may make sense in areas like energy, if, if you are continuing to own those types of companies in an ESG context, you'd want to own the better ones rather than those that are lagging, you can also end up with quite odd results. So tobacco as an industry, you can end up, because of this normalization, this stretching of the distribution, whereas you would expect, and, and as we see in our model, all tobacco companies look bad given their exposure to a potentially high social risk, in this, in this view, you're ending up with some tobacco companies being higher rated. So if you think back to those passive um, funds, depending on their exclusion policies, you need to be very careful and actually look under the bonnet. If they're saying they're only investing in highly rated stocks, some of these tobacco companies could be those, those highly rated stocks. So it comes back to this point of there is a place for relative considerations in ESG, but in certain areas we would just point to having an absolute recognition that tobacco as an industry will face significant risks um, moving forwards. So the way the model is calibrated really does make a difference. So how does this all come together um, in a global equity fund context? Um, we said at the beginning that performance concerns were, were certainly the biggest driver of a, a barrier or a challenge to moving more significantly in this direction. And the key point that I want to make here is that you do not have to sacrifice fundamental exposure for the sake of integrating ESG in your portfolio. The two things are not contradictory, and actually in a lot of cases, governance, as, as an example, is very complementary to a, a higher quality um, view of the world. So on the left-hand side, we show some of the, the more traditional kind of fundamental measures um, that everyone here will be familiar with. And what we're showing here is that the fund has a superior profile, both in, in, in terms of kind of valuation um, measures and also on, on the quality side as well. And then on the right, we show the portfolio's exposure based on our own QEP ESG rating. So AAA here is the best, and C is the worst. You can see we exclude the worst companies at all. We don't, don't invest in them based on their risk characteristics. And we tilt the portfolio towards higher rated stocks. And this is combined with you know, an over 70% reduction in carbon intensity, no exposure to thermal coal, and various other kind of outcome-based measures that we can demonstrate within the portfolio. So it really doesn't need to come at the expense of fundamentals. And to give you the, the picture in terms of the live track record, the ESG fund that we run has, will be running for five years come September. And over that period, we, we track the performance of the blend strategy upon which it's based and the ESG fund as a, as a comparator. And over that period, the ESG fund has outperformed the blend strategy. Um, so it hasn't negatively imp impacted returns. Now, I would, I would caveat that with the fact that you know, the ESG fund is slightly more quality tilted and cl clearly given the the period that we're talking about it has been a more growthy momentum focused market however the key point here is is not the historic returns it's the fact that we've been able to implement esg fully without having a detrimental impact um, on the portfolio and, and as a result of that we're actually seeing a lot of our existing investors transition from our more traditional strategies into the esg variants um, as, as evidenced um, in terms of the asset growth in, in this area. So 
one doesn't come at the expense of the other and they're very much not contradictory um, in the way that you approach them. So doing this in a, in a global context, I would argue is, you know, if you're doing it properly, easy is probably a bit strong, but it, it, it's not so much of a challenge. But I suppose the question on all of your minds is really around what does this mean in, in a local context? And it's been interesting in terms of the meetings that we've had this week when we've been talking um, to some of you here um, about ESG more broadly. And I draw quite a lot of parallels between the local picture and the local kind of comments with other areas like Australia, um, where I, I've been not so long ago. And what I mean by that is that whilst we're saying in a global context, it's very easy to maintain a an attractive portfolio composition and exposure with the ESG integration. A lot of the concern here stems from the fact that the local market is overly dominated by um, potentially poorer E stocks, so on, on the environmental side. And that's what we're showing um, on the left-hand side, the proportion of companies in the, in the local South African market versus the global universe that struggle um, you know, on, on the E side as, a, as an obvious function um, of the exposure within the local market. Now, within Australia, th this picture is very, very similar. Um, and having meetings in Perth with investors who you know, are keen on ESG and I'm surrounded by Rio, Woodside, et cetera, headquarters all around me, seems like a bit of a, you know, an inconsistent, um, problematic area to solve. However, what, what Australian investors have looked to do is actually use their global exposure, and it's very similar to here in that they have a domestic exposure and, and a global allocation, a global exposure to edge their toe into the water of ESG because it is easier there. So that's one consideration to take. But the second thing is actually our view on South Africa um, is that we actually like it um, in terms of the, the investment exposures that we have on the desk. And that's the difference between looking at a global basis versus an EM basis. And on the right hand side here, we show that actually we have a not insignificant overweight position to South Africa, both within our standard um, emerging markets fund, but also in the sustainable version, it's an even higher exposure. So that means that you know, in, a, in an emerging markets context, if you think about um, areas like financials, for example, Chinese financials have you know, not an insignificant um, allocation within the index, we actually far prefer South African um, financials, banks and insurers and have a, a, not an insignificant exposure to them within the portfolio and they, they don't score too badly in terms of um, ESG measures either. So I think in a, in a local picture and particularly in the emerging markets context, South Africa is seen as amongst the best of the bunch um, in, in that area and I would note that our, our composition is very different to the index so if you think about the ESG fund, we're obviously not expo exposed to any companies um, with direct coal exposure. Um, and also NASPERS is uh, a company that we don't own um, across any of our funds, both on valuation uh, as well as other grounds. So there is a high degree of active share within our, within our ownership there, but importantly, um, you know, there, are, there are attractive areas within South Africa that we recognize within our process, albeit with some of that currency hedging that we mentioned uh, as a function of the country risk monitor that we went through earlier. So it doesn't stop at portfolio construction. Um, we certainly need to be very mindful of the active ownership side, and this is where, again, that central sustainability team comes in. So within that team, we have a regular monthly meeting um, to run through research updates, to do controversy analysis, but also to decide on our engagement program um, for the period ahead. So we do this on a, on a quarterly basis. We will determine what are the priority companies and topics um, that we would like them to cover and engage with companies on directly. Now, you can see the breadth here, um, and our portfolios are, are quite diversified, so that enables us to also benefit from all of the other engagement activities that are happening at a, at a Schroeder's firm-wide level. So we've done over 330 company engagements in total, and a lot of those have been initiated by our team directly. And this is combining the observations of portfolio managers on a day-to-day -day basis with raising these conversations and these issues with companies to get their direct input so that we can feed that back um, in the investment process. Now, engagement does take time. It's not something that happens overnight if you make a request to a company, but over the longer period, we can see that 40% um, of our engagement conversations have resulted in positive change from companies. So this is e 
a company moving in the right direction, listening to what we've said alongside other investors, and making changes for the better within their processes or policies. And you can see that's across a, you know, a wide range of um, areas, ESG, but also topics within that. Um, and a current topic for, for reference would be we're looking in more detail at the kind of um, the, the labour rights issues associated with some of the, the acts within um, the UK and on a global basis to make sure that how companies are uh, measuring and monitoring how employees are being treated both directly but also within their supply chains as well. And then finally, the, so the last point, if you remember back to the very first slide, we were talking about the, the potential difficulties and, and barriers to investing in ESG. And one of those is around reporting, um, which some people really seem to struggle with. Um, you know, it's not as easy as doing a PE ratio um, on the fundamental side or looking at the dividend yield of the portfolio versus the index. But we would argue that this can be done properly um, and insightfully. And so th there's a few different angles that we would look at. So first of all, on the, on the kind of investment desk side, we run daily reports, which look at multiple measures across E, S, and G, e, S, G, and G areas for all of our funds across the desk. And that will cover areas like the carbon intensity of the portfolio, the total carbon emissions, how much exposure have we got to potential emissions. On the governance side, we'll be looking at dividend run rates, at how much of our exposure is in companies with a degree of government ownership, etc. And we can monitor all of these areas and actually demonstrate the difference between the fund um, and the index. And that will inform um, our research process and our investment insights as well. The second area is um, a, a model, proprietary model, that's been built by our central sustainability team called SustainX. Now, some of you will, will probably be aware of this already, but what we're trying to do there is tie um, the externalities that companies create to what the impact on their earnings would be if those areas were internalized. So to give you an example, you're looking at the cost to society of smoking understanding companies' market share in terms of the tobacco industry, and then saying if regulations increase, as we've seen you know, over recent years, or whether it's around menthol cigarettes or, or other areas, how much is that going to cost the company in terms of their revenue? And we can link that also um, to other different views, whether that be positive, negative externalities, linking to some of the higher SDG level goals. Um, and it's been, been found to be quite a useful um, lens for areas like charities, um, who are particularly focused on um, social pressures uh, within those areas. And then finally, an ongoing project is actually to, to start looking at ESG fact sheets across all of the funds, both equity and on the credit side that we run um, as a firm. So watch out for those as we run through. You can see Condi creeping towards me, so I'm, um, I think I'm out of time. But um, hopefully that's been kind of a, a helpful introduction. Um, I suppose the one of the main points here, again, not very fitting with the only the fittest investors will survive, but within, e within ESG in a global equity context, you can have your cake and eat it. You don't have to sacrifice performance in order to integrate ESG. But I would caveat with that, saying that you cannot do that in an, in an inefficient um, or passive-led approach that isn't conscious of the resulting exposures that you will be getting by integrating ESG. The two very much have to come hand in hand. And active ownership, which you can only manage if you have you know, the network that we do in terms of having analysts in the local countries, speaking the local languages, raising these topics with companies directly and putting the pressure on um, to improve in terms of their, their sustainability profile, is a key proponent um, to doing that successfully. Um, and we've mentioned in terms of the, the reporting side, that is possible to do, and there are lots of different lenses that we can share with you, which might be helpful in terms of, of grouping your overall managers. Um, and the, the point I'd leave you with would be, you know, depending on what location I'm in, who, who I'm seeing, and the, how the discussion is on ESG, there are still people who don't believe in any of this. Um, you know, I haven't had a conversation with Donald Trump, but I'd expect that that would be his view if I had the pleasure. Um, there are lots of people who didn't believe in this, but increasingly are struggling to ignore it. If you believe it because of social reasons, societal reasons, because of climate change, none of that really matters because the fact of the matter is that the weight of investor assets is moving in this direction. Um, so I'd leave you with the point that this really is too important to ignore. And it's even more important to make sure that you're doing this properly um, within your, your manager's investment processes.